Hello, Internet, and welcome once again to the Free to Play cast brought to you by MMOBomb.com, your home for all things free to play related. I'm Mike Byrne, aka Magic Man, your host, and this is episode 255. Excuse the frog voice, I got a little, little throat thing going on here. <laughs> me, 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 me. It's March 15th, you're watching it on the 16th or later, and we've got, uh, you know, free to play news. With me to talk about it, as always, Ms. Quintlin Bowers. What's up, Q? As always, I'm not here every time. Well, I mean, as always, <laughs> as in, like, there's always people here. It's not just me talking to myself. <laughs> also on the line, Mr. Zach Sharps. Not as always, but as most of the time, sometimes, every now and then, occasionally, yeah, depending well, on what school's doing. <laughs> Wait, you're you're not always this here alone talking to yourself? I mean... Yeah, well, the, the weeks you're on the show, I don't have to do it by myself. When I don't know about if you know about this, if you've watched the show when you're not on it, it's just me by myself. So. Damn, that's deep. Uh, speaking of shows, quick announcement before we get started with the news. No free-to-play cast next week. I will be out on vacation. Uh, very few times do I get a vacation from work work and MMO bomb work at the same time. This time it worked out, so I will be gone next week. But we do have uh, free-to-play weeklies coming at you this weekend and the following weekend, which I will still post uh, for you. And then we have two... Two or three first looks on deck. So should be a vi busy video week even without the free-to-play cast next week. Uh, on that note, let's move over and get started with the news. Oh, Valve. We're going to talk about you in a few minutes here, but oh, Valve. But first, I think we should get started with an editorial gone horribly awry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so if you've been following uh, MMO Bomb for a while, you know that our own Mr. Jason Winter is uh, an editorial type of guy. He likes to write him some editorials on topics. Uh, what you may not know in those pieces, though, is that there's generally feedback from everybody on there. So though Jason gets credited with uh, the, the article and everything... It is something that Q, while he's writing, we are kind of talking about in the back end on Skype and giving our ideas on things. Or he'll ask a question, hey, would this make a good editorial? And we'll banter it back and forth. So when he proposed this editorial, I think we were all kind of fine with it. And just to give you an idea of date ranges here to, so that you can understand how quickly this went wrong... <laughs> Uh, Jason's editorial was posted, published on the website on February 27th, okay? Remember that, February 27th, basically second to last day of February. Uh, and what we talked about in the editorial was H1Z1 and would it go back to free-to-play? Now, for those of you keeping score, H1Z1 was announced as free-to-play, converted to buy-to-play, split off into two games, one game, is it even still up anymore? Didn't they just recently get rid of one of them? I don't know, because they market <laughs> H1Z1 now as H1Z1. So Yeah, they, they changed. The, oh, that's right. And the other one, which was what? H1Z1. Just Survive. Just Survive I is now, yeah. I think, just, just Survive, isn't it? Possibly. I, I have no idea. Let's, let's, let's go to Steam. Let's... I don't know. I don't. I don't get emails on anything but regular H one Z one. For some reason, that's what they like to send me. Uh, okay, so yeah, we're 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 right, Zach. We cobbled it together correctly. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so H one Z one just survive is now just survive. That's it. Mm -hmm. Twenty bucks to get into that one. Still considered early access. And then H one Z one Battle Royale or H one Z one King of the Hill, I think is what it originally was. King of the Kill. Uh, King yeah. of the Kill. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. Is now just H one Z one. Well, Jason's editorial speculated on, well, will H1Z1 go back to free-to-play? Because it had kind of been on a, a downward slope for a little while. And at the end, he basically said, no, Q, I don't think it's going to go free-to-play. Because although it may be on a downward slope, its numbers were still kind of in line with where it had originally started when you had to pay to get into it anyway. Uh, and so though it exploded and then got really uh, low, the really low points were still equal to the original points. And so he speculated there's really no need to go free to play. And I don't think any of us disagreed with that at the time that he posted it when we looked at the numbers. Right, Q? 
Honestly, I don't think I was there for that conversation. <laughs> Neither was I. <laughs> <laughs> I do not remember this conversation at all, but it, se- it seems like we, we'd probably end up uh, uh, agreeing with Jason, kind of like we do on the whole, shouldn't lawbreakers be free to play by now? Right. <laughs> so... <laughs> Right. I so, mean, for me, I just, I just think that I would have been like, okay, well, they should go free to play, but considering it's daybreak, they probably won't. You know. So. Right. Well, so here and here's the numbers for you that he was using. Um, so, so things like Steam charts, they showed H one Z one kind of just hemorrhaging players. They were at a peak of 150 thousand plus in July, and then down to like 16 thousand for the last 30 days, which was you know February at that time. Obviously, right? Some big things happened. PUBG. Uh, kind of entered that space uh, in that time and became, you know, what we all know it for today. But he went back and looked, you know, in April and August when the game split into two things in in 2016, it was averaging between seven to nine thousand concurrent players with a max of just under fifteen thousand. So that's where he came up with the conclusion, Zach, that yeah, it was way up there and fell back to earth. But its fall back to earth numbers were where it was before it skyrocketed for a little while anyway. So, yeah, you might pick up some going free to play, but it's not necessarily a cause for panic like a dying game, uh, something like a Lawbreakers, uh, where free to play would be forced. And so he suggested probably not going to happen. And I don't think any of the logic was all that unsound when you're just looking at it objectively, is there? I mean, if you look at it from like a, a trend perspective, um, the Steam chart that I looked at, I posted up on my Twitter, it was definitely in a downward trend where from where it originally started to where it peaked, that would be an upward trend. So right. they, there are definite, definite differences there. And I think they just realized that in order for them to capture more people, they needed to go the Fortnite route and go free to play. So, and, and that was Jason's one caveat cue that, if it continues to decline and starts hitting the two and three thousand player marks, then yeah, there's cause for concern and want to switch to free to play. But if indication was it was going to level off at the same numbers that it had pre explosion, well, you were fine with it being buy to play then, you should probably be fine buy to play now. Enter Daybreak and their thoughts. <laughs> Just on March 8th, so a mere nine days later. <laughs> H1Z1 announced that it was going free to play. The esports league was formally announced, something we knew was coming and had been talked about behind the scenes for a while. And the auto royale mode, the car version of the the battle royale mode, was going to be included in the free to play uh, split. So, pretty much one week later, Daybreak said, "Jason, you're wrong." Q. <laughs> you know they could have done it just to make Jason wrong. Yeah. I- <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, they, they're just sitting there, and uh, Hartsman is like, you know what, this Jason guy. <laughs> well, Hartsman. Or no, not Hartsman, sorry. Um, I was like, wait, Hartsman, shit. try on. Where'd well, try on get into this? <laughs> I mean, you don't even have Smedley but, over there anymore that you could throw yeah, his name. They, 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 they're probably oh, no, I'm just talking, wait, this I one guy, see. this one guy. Keep talking, even though I can't hear you. <laughs> Oh god, he broke it. <laughs> now I can hear you. All right, good. He broke it. I broke it. I broke it. Already um, Mike broke the cast. So okay. yeah, they could have <laughs> done it just to say Jason is wrong. But uh, on the other hand, like you mentioned the esports thing, right? I mean for esports, I and I, I think I've said this before, to me for esports to be as open as possible for them to get the really good players and everything else in there to 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 really have that pool of potentially good players you need to be free to play yeah and so here's my kind of question along those lines for for uh, you two here zach you had talked about trending and jason had even speculated if the trending continued to go down that you would need to go free to play okay fine I, I can almost see a big argument for this should have happened at your peak, right? When when you were at 150,000 people and it just started to come down and you knew PUBG was out there and was, you know, if, if honestly, if you love the Battle Royale mode, Zach, I, and you got to pay for one, 
which are you going to buy at this point, PUBG or H1Z1? I think it's an easy <laughs> decision for most players. I'm going to play the game that millions of other people are playing on all systems. I, I think it's an easy call there. Uh, and so I can see an argument where when you started going from 150 to 140 to 130, is free to play now too little too late, Zach? Well, I think it's typical developer lag. There's a lot of instances where you can look at developers that should have swapped to a different payment model or done something else, and they don't for a good bit of time. But typically, when you look at that lag, you have to wonder, is it arrogance, or is it just negligence, or is it philosophy, which leads to negligence? Um, and I think in this case, it's a mix of both arrogance and also negligence. Um, I mean, if you look at a lot of the times when they talk about H1Z1, they don't really own up to the fact that there's stuff that they can work on where with PUBG, i get a little bit of hints like okay there's stuff that they can work on they mention it from time to time yes it's a bug filled game but at least they tend to update their you know player base a good bit and take some feedback fortnite is very rapid feedback epic has been doing a fantastic job with that game yeah so even if the feedback sometimes is epic, is what the fuck are you doing you can't exactly. sue 12 year olds please stop this madness <laughs> yeah exactly and they they tend to you know do something about it but it's it's one of those things where I just don't think that Daybreak is doing this because they think free-to-play is the best option, but they're doing it because they know that in the next 6 to 12 months, H1Z1 might be gone or very, very low player numbers if they don't do this, um, especially because Fortnite. Uh, I will tell you, Q, according to, again, Steam Charts being a, a nice indicator, not be-all, end-all, of course, but a nice indicator of the, the population health of a game, uh, H1Z1 is now trending at around 24, 25,000. So they definitely got the boost that normally comes with free to play games. But again, is there an argument that, man, what would that boost have looked like if you would have done it at the 100,000 player mark while you had 100,000 people to go tell their friends, hey, my game that I'm playing now is free to play. Why don't you jump in tonight? Where now you're dealing with six to nine thousand people telling their friends, and you get the the boost to twenty four thousand, or just you know before because they they could have looked at it too and been you know what there's these two other games that you know just like right? like before the two other games completely overtook them, <laughs> basically yep. came in and went we have lots of players maybe we want to keep these players and gain more and not let them take all the players yep uh now we had previously done way back when when it was free to play we had done a first look for h1z1 uh but we did want to do something to update it video wise so jason did take a look at the auto royale version of the game uh, in a first look video that we posted last week. So if you're interested in that new content, which is part of the free to play uh, experience, we do have a first look on the site. That led, that whole debacle uh, led to us posting today an article of the top five free to play games that weren't. Um, <laughs> the, the games that were supposed to be free to play that ended up buy to play. And we're not talking about things here, Q, like Overwatch, right? When it was originally announced we all thought based on genre this is probably going to be free to play but we're gonna we'll, so we'll write about it but for now blizzard. and wait yeah but it's blizzard and it could go either way black desert online we kind of think this should be free to play and then when they announced that it, we're not talking about those we're talking about games that they actually were slated to be free to play <laughs> and h1z1 <laughs> was number one on our list <laughs> um now, also, we have Lawbreakers. I don't think any surprise there, right? Originally touted as being free-to-play, then saying free-to-play wouldn't work and going the bly-to-play route. Interesting, though, Zach, uh, or Q, you want to share the little stat that Jason happened to see yesterday on Steam Charts? Oh, my God. So, and to, to, to give you a frame of reference for this, um, I've been, like, I, I, I was gifted Agents of Mayhem, recently and i've been playing it and that game was panned like crazy right i'm enjoying it but i think it's got something like i don't know uh somewhere between 60 and 100 players on it the last time i looked and lawbreakers which is a multiplayer thing has one 
<laughs> Zach, yesterday in the middle of the afternoon, it literally, Jason was like, take a look at this, guys. It had one, <laughs> one person, uh, according to Steam charts, playing in the last hour. Uh, I've gone and looked at comments since then that are like, people are waiting four hours for queues. What? What? I mean, at that point, wow. you have to be waiting just to see how long the wait is, right? Not because you really want to play, just because you want to see how long the wait is. <laughs> That's I mean, it could worse. be like, go ahead. I was gonna say that's worse than um, the DC mobile. I think it's called Infinite Crisis. I remember waiting for like forty-five minutes, oh, forty-five yeah. minute queues, and that was that was about when they killed the game off. Yep. Lawbreakers hasn't been written off yet. Yet, well, <laughs> okay. Well, according to according to Nexon, by... you know, they kind of just dodged that question. They were just like, "Yeah, whatever." Somebody implied that you know they I'm wrote it off. I'm talking development articles across the board. That's <laughs> what I mean by ending. And <laughs> but writing. it has been obviously been written off by the players. Oh yeah. Right. Like, so Q and like I at that washed. point started like scouring their forums, right, and just to see what. And we noticed like any thread that had anything to do with a free to play conversion or here's an idea uh, for increasing player base or like there was criticism feeds in there like, oh, you should balance this and stuff. And those were generally untouched. They were they were left as is. But any thread that was like and even if they weren't vilely written, they were, you, hey, guys, we don't have players make it free to play for us. They were closed by somebody within like five replies with no nasty like reddit or steam review type replies that you typically see nobody got nasty they were just closed with no developer response at all not even a had been there done that had this conversation 50 times please go see this thread I mean, nothing they just closed them uh and the last dev posts were from the or dev replies to anything not just posts but replies were like the middle of february so it's now been like well three to four weeks i mean it's not like there. cliffy b has anything else better to do i mean the game <laughs> well that was our player. question too you have like 30 to 50 employees <laughs> no, how is B's... there how is there only one person online <laughs> probably him he's probably <laughs> just chilling there trying to keep the steam numbers from hitting zero <laughs> Cliffy, Cliffy B's out there. See what he's busy doing is still he's running around telling people not to call him cliffy b right yeah. <laughs> that's what he's busy doing he'll forever he's be like... cliffy b oh see i can't do that like i you know if somebody asks for their name to be a said a certain way i can at least show them that much respect like those guys that jonathan's that want to be you know like, can i call you john no i want to be jonathan all right you're a douche but that's fine not really a douche anybody out there named jonathan that prefers i'm just teasing uh the other <laughs> the other games we put on that list landmark i think that's a given um atlas reactor which was free to play supposed to be free to play then buy to play then made really shitty free to play then made into a decent free to play model so we got that one on there and then albion online which was one a lot of people were kind of looking forward to as a sandboxy adventure uh, you know kind of right up zach's alley with more go do whatever the hell you want um but since it was a niche market they converted to uh buy to play before launch so take a look at that interesting about h1z1 if you want to check it out we got the first look moving on let's talk about valve oh crap here we go <laughs> uh can, let's let's talk about the second aspect of this first because i think this will be shorter artifact the dota card game that's definitely not a dota 2 card game yeah i don't i don't understand any of that i read it it confused me i moved on <laughs> show you this little <laughs> this little image here <laughs> artifact the dota card game artifact and dota 2 underlined there on the right artifact isn't a dota 2 card game the only thing i can <laughs> think to make sense of this is that the card game is not inspired by dota 2 it's inspired by the dota gameplay model i, I that's the only way that's, i can kind of that's how I reconcile those those statements that's how i read it which is what made me go because it, one's a card game and one is not. So. <laughs> right. So I don't and think Dota's not a genre either. MOBA's a genre. So, right. Yeah, yeah. I would have assumed I, that maybe they would have used the word it's a MOBA site because they do talk about yeah. the in a presentation that they gave to uh, about the game. They did talk about uh, lanes and controlling uh, five heroes and and, st and when you die, you can respawn and come back when when one person dies. So there were I, I would have expected that. Set 
sentence. I think they're trying to just... <laughs> No, this game mode is called Dota. It's us. No, it's a MOBA. <laughs> it's a MOBA. So I, I kind of got the same thing, Zach, that they were just trying to brand the mobile genre or MOBA genre as Dota. Um, and the card game itself is not based on Dota 2. That's a specific game. But it's a MOBA. It should should say it's a, mo- a card game based on MOBA style gameplay. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, this was one that we thought was going to be free to play, but also... It's not, Zach. Which, good call, bad call, interesting call. What do you think? I mean, it depends how they implement it, but there's so many card games out there that are free to play that are already very well established. You know, you have Hearthstone, you have Shadowverse, um, just to name two off the top of my head. I'd for some oh, Elder Scrolls Legends, and there's a lot of other ones out there too that I'm sure I'm completely forgetting because it's been a while since card games were, you know, super relevant. But, um, now they're coming out with a, a buy to play card game. Like it's it's kind of just like H one Z one being in a, a sea of like new battle royale games coming out as free to play uh, with Fortnite, and there's a lot of other ones on the horizon too that are smaller. Um, and so I, I just don't understand why, as a new entrant to a market that's already a particular payment model, why we, you would do something so distinctly different. The only way I could see it working is if it has the the Blizzard effect, where because it's Valve, it ends up working out, um, which could possibly end up being the case. According to uh, IGN, uh, Q, we've got a couple details about this one. Um, it's already in closed beta. That's kind of industry professionals at the moment. It's not really a player sign-up type deal. Uh, they want to release this by the end of 2018, the first tournament in Q1 of 2019, and iOS and Android versions in mid-2019. It'll also be the first Source 2 title to run on mobile devices. No pricing or exact dates or anything. Here's something that I thought was interesting, though, for a buy-to-play game. Uh, no single-player campaign. Nothing. And I know in card games, you know, it's typically threadbare anyway, but it, nothing. It's a focus on playing human opponents. I, this is either, to me, this is either going to stunningly flop or be ridiculously successful. I just don't see a middle ground for Artifact. And unfortunately, the feedback so far from players... Uh, on what they've seen, you know, not being able to touch the game, that's very different. They're just basing it on what they've seen and been presented with. It is overwhelmingly negative feedback for this one, Q. So, uh, on, on the logic, though, and, and this is not making excuses for Valve making a, a pay-to-play card game, but wasn't there something mentioned about them wanting to be able to buy and sell cards on the Steam Marketplace? Yeah, that was something you brought up in chat the, as an interesting reason why they might have to make this one buy to play. Well, I think Jason actually brought it up, and I agreed that that would make sense at that point for it to be buy to play. If you're mm-hmm. buying and selling cards on the marketplace, then you know the whole like it just it. I think it would be kind of weird and convoluted. I mean, I don't know. I guess you could craft cards in game and then sell them on the Steam marketplace or or something. But it, it, as far as like it being like a normal and, and they are, you know, doing this whole, hey, look, it's, you know, being done by the guy from the original magic game. So it's like magic kind of thing. Um, I kind of think that might be the logic they're using. Well, we're going to let them buy and sell cards like a real pay- cardboard crack game. So we'll just make it all buy to play. To be clear on the single player portion, I mean, they do plan a tutorial type thing. It's But as far as there's no campaign, like sitting there playing by yourself, going through a story or unlocking heroes and stuff like that. Um, I don't know, Zach. There's enough different from a Hearthstone, uh, a Hearthstone clone that I- I'm definitely going to check this out. Uh, I mean, there's two resources. You've got your mana and you've got your gold. There's new heroes that are going to be added to the game and things like that. I mean, th- it plays like a Dota 2 type game with the laning and and resource management and things like that. Um, uh, it seems like a pretty could be pretty complex, but I'm just worried. Like, how do you monetize this type of game then? If it's going to be 
50 or 40, let's say it's anywhere from 30 to 50 bucks one time shot. Can you really expect to sell card packs at that point? I mean, oh my God, that'd be brutal, wouldn't it? I mean, they would have to go like a 20 or $15 route, I think, uh, as an initial entry and then additional booster packs after that. I think that's the only way it would end up working as a buy to play game. If they charge like $30 or more, I think it's going to epically flop. And I think it's going to probably flop quite significantly just to begin with. I mean, uh, I, I looked at the reveal trailer that they showed at, at one of their uh, one of their events. I forget what it was, just because I was curious and it showed up on my recommended. Because I saw the initial reveal trailer, but I didn't see like an audience reaction, for instance. And it was just laughter and booze. And I think that's literally what everyone sort of thinks about Artifact, is this either laughter or they're just really pissed at it because they want something different. And I'm not saying that they want Half-Life 3, but... They probably they do want, want something more three. significant. <laughs> of course they do, but they, if they if Valve came out with something more significant than a card game, I think people would be fine with it. But I just don't think that this is what Dota players wanted. Uh, on the pricing, if if they are planning on like doing something similar to real world card games, I just looked just kind of on like I, I just googled uh, Magic: The Gathering starter decks, and they've got like. The, the deck builder's toolkit, of course, keeping in mind that these are real things that you hold in your hands, are like 40 bucks. So it's entirely possible they might try to go with a pricing model about that range. So That'd here, be insane. Yeah, here's actually <laughs> Gabe Newell's quote, according to uh, PC Gamer, on the subject of it not being free to play, Q. Uh, if time is free, or an account is free, or cards are free, then anything that has a mathematical relationship to those things ends up becoming devalued over time. Whether it's the player's time and you just make people grind for thousands of hours for minor trivial improvements, or the asset values of the cards, or whatever. That's a consequence. So you don't want to create that flood of free stuff that destroys the economy and the value of people's time. Gabe Newell, Dota 2 is a waste of time. <laughs> Heard it here first. <laughs> I mean, this is the company that went, you know what, we're just making everything free to play and we're going to force it into your Steam account whether you want it or not. I'm still really bitter about that, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and so here's, uh, again, from PC Gamer, the, the costing. While Valve isn't talking numbers, oh, I always give credit to the individual authors, too, uh, for the work they all do. This is Tim Clark over at PC uh, Gamer. Uh, and see, now scrolling up. There we go. What Valve isn't uh, doing is, that's not what I wanted. Where is it? <laughs> oh, man. No, that's I mean that is that is what they're doing. Oh, I mean Valve's doing what everyone didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, where'd it go? See, I did. Oh, here on the subject of cost, uh, artifacts not going to be free. What Valve isn't doing is talking numbers, but from speaking to staff at the event, it sounds like, and this is just Tim speculating from the the preview. But from speaking to staff at the event, it sounds like there will be some sort of entry edition that will get you a bunch of the cards and other content, much as Overwatch asks you to pay for the base game to get in the door. Beyond that, you can buy and crack packs as normal, which Newell says Valve is determined to make a spectatable event. Uh, whatever money you do pump into packs will be partly used to fund major tournaments in much the same way that sales of the Compendium and Battle Pass inflate the International's prize pool each year. Speaking of esports, Valve is already lining that up with a major $1 million prize pool. I, I don't care how complex and in-depth and valuable and all this stuff is. I, my mind cannot get around a card game no matter, and the differences between Hearthstone and this are night and day, right? To me, looking at it, it's like playing checkers versus playing chess. There's a big difference in what's going on. Granted, I will give Valve that, but this just seems like I would never pay $20, $30, $40 to buy a card game in which I then either spend time farming up whatever I need to buy game packs uh, in-game or spend money to... To me, that just... I, my brain won't go around that barrier, Zach, and I think it's kind of an unnecessary barrier for this genre. I don't... Good luck to them, but I just don't <laughs> see it. 
And I don't yeah. see the idea of the game creating enough positive interest right now where this could be used as a successful test on that type of business model, Q. It's, it's pre being pretty negatively received still. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's one of those things that could flip around, too. I remember when Hearthstone was first introduced, everybody was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and why is this even a thing? Like, just the reaction, you know, when you watched it, when they announced it, it was it was amazing how many people hated the idea. So yep. it could it could totally, once it's out there and people see it, people could be fine with it. But I, I think, as far as I can tell, just from, from what we've heard and seen, I think they're really using, like, real cardboard crack logic on it. And, and it's, not, it's not a physical thing that you can hold and collect and store in giant containers in your house. Yeah, I, but the ability to trade you know. does give it some type of inherent value, even if it's not cash value. Unfortunately, right. being buy to play, this is probably the last time we're going to talk about it on this show. Uh, but I'll be sure to sneak in an update after I've played it and give you my thoughts. And I'm, you know, sure somebody on the panel, whether it's Jason or Zach or Troy, will will pick it up and will bring us both on and talk about it a little bit more on the free to play side of Valve. Dota 2 is getting a subscription feature, which I don't think anybody really has a problem with that. It's just a variant on their battle pass that already existed, uh, Zach, right? I mean, for the most part, I mean, it gives the challenges and the events and the rewards and stuff of the battle pass, which was something that was done by season. Now they're doing just a, you know, a monthly sub and not very expensive, $3.99 a month with a discount uh, if you do six and 12 month blocks. I think on the surface, nobody really cares, right? Oh, okay, they took the battle pass and they made it a sub instead. All right, good. But there's one little thing they snuck in there that kind of has some feathers ruffled, Q. The final component of the package, in Valve's own words, offers real-time item and ability suggestions generated from data gathered across millions of recent games at each skill bracket to keep you up to date on the latest trends. Whether you need advice on which hero best fits a draft, so pre-game advice, or you aren't sure what to build after securing that coveted blink dagger plus assistant is in your corner. So it's making recommendations on, hey, Zach, you should pick this hero because your team's doing these heroes and you're going up against these heroes. This would be a good fit based on this. But it's also doing in-game, second-by-second timeline of incoming damage, stuns, and other uh, disabling effects. Offering lane strategies, all types of other analytics in the game. And while I don't think this feature itself is a bad idea, do not get me wrong. I think this is a great thing, right? Particularly for somebody like me who isn't great at MOBAs, who isn't really going to take the time to get into the meta to, that it takes in some of these games like Dota 2 or whatever, or just a, a neophyte at a game, picking it up for the first time. These are excellent things for that. But it works in the PvP, and only sub-based people have it, Zach. So mm -hmm. is it pay to win? Total Biscuit thinks it it definitely tips in favor of pay to win because even if that advantage is this big, it is an advantage. And I, mean, I can see that argument, but I can also see the other side where this would be great for somebody like me, somebody that's taken 700 hours of Dota at this point, they're probably going to shut the fucking thing off. <laughs> it's, it's probably going to be more annoying to somebody like that. So is it pay to win, Zach? I say no because my definition of pay to win is um, more precise than a lot of people's. Um, no pro is going to get an advantage over um, over another pro with this feature. It's just not the case. So it can't be pay to win by definition because you can't pay and win against anyone or have an advantage over anyone because a lot of the skilled players already have this knowledge in their head or they have guides up next to them and they already know what to do. Um, so. 
I think it's a really terrible idea because it should be a feature for everyone, like every other MOBA has, you know, suggestions and um, stuff like that. I don't think a lot of MOBAs have like graph suggestions. So that's, you know, something new. But I think that should just be across the board for everyone. I mean, there's really uh, no reason why this should be a thing because the battle passes were already selling really, really well. So that's not an excuse. So I, I really, I don't know. I think they could figure out a different way to um entice people to subscribe monthly rather than you know putting in like a tutorial feature which is really good for basically beginner to moderate skill players um but more experienced players you know look at this is like who cares so yeah I, and, and here's total biscuits thoughts on it this dota plus thing with the in-game assistant that you have to pay for doesn't sit right with me Giving players info they don't have access to in-game, in real time, you know, certainly pointing out the difference between uh, getting this in real time in the game versus pulling the same information from Zach's YouTube Dota 2 guide videos, right? He, Zach can get this type of information, or I could by watching Zach's videos. The difference here, you know, Total Biscuit pointing out in real time. Giving players info they don't have access to in-game in real time unless they pay a subscription in a competitive game is, however small, an advantage one pays for or pay to win. Personally, I think that feature should be available to everyone in-game at no cost or not available at all. I think uh, it's maybe that it's not that useful past a fairly low tier of play, a point all three of us have made, but a lot mm -hmm. of people play at that level. Q, do you agree? Is he, is he on point here? Is there an advantage? Is it pay to win? So, yeah, I think, I think so, because like Zach said, Pro players or, you know, uh, whatever the ranks in Dota are, you know, the higher rank players, they're probably not going to use it. They're all skilled. They spend hours doing this. They they know what they're doing. They don't need this kind of help. But the people that are going to be use it, using it are the same, pe are going to be matched with people of their own level. So, I mean, you and know, to like... Biscuit's point that tier of players is 5% of your player base, the ones that are uber enough that they're never going right. to use this thing or look at it. So yeah, there is that argument, but when 80% of your player base sits at that lower level of experience and immersion into it... Then yeah, the people who are who are getting this service because they're paying for it are getting a, you know an advantage over the other players that, that wouldn't lose... But, you know, and because not everybody like not everybody at your rank is going to be paying to 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 get this service. And like Zach said, they're they're they were doing really well with their the other packages and stuff they're providing. I, I do think this should just be something that's available to everybody, because if for no other reason than than having this kind of assistance for people who generally feel like man i just really suck at this i don't know what i'm doing it's you know like people who who are complete noobs who would like to get into it but are just totally afraid to because it's so daunting if they just offered it to everybody it might actually be something that would could you know convince those players who are on the edge to drop in and try the game and and actually start playing it actively yeah, I, and I think I'm totally on board with you. I, I disagree with you, Zach, a little bit, just because my definition of pay to win varies from yours just a little bit. Uh, mine is if I pay for something that gives me any statistical or strategic advantage over you that I can only obtain through paying, no matter how small, that is an element of pay to win. Is it egregious in this case? Probably not. I, I don't think it's going to make... The, it's not going to be the be-all, end-all. It might give me an edge in this match and do nothing for me in this particular match. But the fact that I think it can give me an edge sometimes uh, if I take its advice and its advice is sound. Again, we don't know how well the system works. Uh, I, I think it, there is an element of pay to win. I think I'm kind of right in line with Total Biscuit on this one. Uh, yeah, I, I just would call it pay, pay for convenience, but in a really bad way. Q, um, that's I'm, a stummy move. I think you're dead right. I mean, this should be a feature that everybody has. The Battle Pass was selling well already. Didn't have anything like this in it. And this thing is not the only part of the subscription. Like, the events, the badges, there is value in that subscription already. Um, this is a cool feature that I don't think anybody is saying shouldn't be there. 
But if it's going to be there, just make it available for everybody. I think this one's an easy fix and kind of a needless little pay-to-win controversy for a game that generally doesn't get any real pay-to-win controversy. Mm-hmm. Uh, finally, some bad news to report on one aspect of this story, but some good news to report in in how it's being handled. And big shout out to MMO culture here. Again, we've got some translation work going on and we, we tend to look at MMO culture and Cinderboy over there for a lot of that. So huge thumbs up, Cinderboy. Thank you. Uh, Netmarble in a little bit of trouble with the South Korean government, uh, but unfortunately to get to be in a little bit of trouble, three people had to die. So our condolences, obviously, to their loved ones and their families. Three employees of Netmarble died recently, uh, one reportedly working 80 to 90 hours per week during October. And we're, it, we're talking about, um, like, crunch time, right, when the, when the game's going to ship. Uh, and everybody's – it's officially stated as, as a heart issue, a coronary issue – which Netmarble initially denied uh, was related to overworking, but according to the reports, he worked nearly 96 hours during the first week of October, 83 hours during the fourth, fourth, and he passed away on Sunday when he was rescheduled to report back to the office. Now, Netmarble, on the other side of these deaths, banned excessive overtime work. Okay, but... The South Korean government did get involved here, too, and uh, took it a little further, Zach. They, they took it a little further than just excessive overtime hours. So now employees at Netmarble are generally limited uh, to eight-hour workdays, including one hour for lunch, prohibited from working between the hours of 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. without special authorization. Pregnant employees are further limited to even a 30-hour work week. Did it really have to go this far for a video game? I mean, in terms of regulations, there's a lot of developers that do over oh, yeah. abundance of crunch. And it's absolutely disgusting. It's a mismanagement of your employee base and also just the project overall. There was a, a great article that I read a while back that covered crunch and how detrimental it is um, you know, to employee health and also just uh, how normal it is because if you see if you say for example there's you're in a crunch period you're trying to get the game out and there's a deadline and everyone's working you know 10 you know 12 hour days if not longer and you see one person leave after eight hours that person's going to be completely just everyone's going to hate them uh, yeah. just across the board because yeah. they're not working hard enough there so are executives a, that normalize huge, this too yeah it's a huge Publicly. peer pressure thing yeah it's psychologically manipulative, um, from one, and it's just, it's just really bad, and it's just pure mismanagement. That's all it is. But it's it's been a thing for like freaking ever. Did you guys ever see the movie Pirates of Silicon Valley? Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. You do you remember like when when uh, Steve Jobs was doing the whole thing where he was pitting the two portion the two sections of Apple against each yep. other, and he went out and made those T-shirts for his team that said ninety hours a week and loving it. Yeah. Like it mm-hmm. was, it was just demanded, you know, even, even from these, you know, just large tech companies, 90 hours a week to get this thing done. It needs to be done now. And it's, I mean, that was the seventies, eighties. So yep. this has been going on for a really long time What's, with, if you, you know, if you're looking for some feedback on this one, uh, Jim Sterling has a video specifically on Crunch back in April of 2016. And whether or not you're a fan of Jim Sterling, totally cast that and his whole persona and presentation. Cast that aside for a minute and check out the video. Uh, it's an episode of the Jim Quisition on Crunch. So just search Jim Sterling Crunch and, and you'll find it. Uh, and he talks about the same thing, Q, on how long this has been going on and everybody knew it and there's certain executives that tout it as a requirement as a point of pride as a point of we're we're developing art you know that's what it takes and jim takes a look at this is really an outdated this this should not be happening anymore given the state Mm -hmm. of the 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 industry so again, set set your opinions of Jim Sterling aside for a second and watch it on this topic, because it's sad to see that, yeah, it takes a toll and 
these three people, it took the ultimate toll. Really, really young people, too. Really young people. Uh, so our condolences there. Let's slide over and do the weekly bombs. Q, you're up. I, I'm actually going to give a debomb to fun com for finally announcing Secret World Legends uh... Season 2. Finally, we get new content. They're taking us to South Africa. It's going to be a Jonestown kind of thing. <laughs> so everybody's pretty excited. And also some serious props to um, Ninja and Twitch and, and Drake. for they, they basically killed Twitch last night. Like literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, props to them for doing something that apparently everybody had a really good time. Well... The, the people who actually got to watch it before it started crashing on them. <laughs> so. Here's the thank you. To me, this is the make or break moment for the Secret World, Secret World Legends and Funcom. This yes. is the moment that people like you were willing to go to Secret World Legends and start over to play for it, where people like me who love the Secret World I just, I couldn't do that all again. I just couldn't. And now that you're here, if this flops, you're the audience they can't afford to lose. This is the make yeah. or break moment. This was the only reason you were willing to do it, was to continue right, right that now, story. To, to be honest, like I, I was, I did the whole, you know, subbing thing while I was leveling up, trying to get back up to 50 on the new character. And I was really pissed off that we just couldn't, yeah. be put over there at the at the level that we were at to begin with anyway i kind of get it but it still annoyed the hell out of me i've i've lived through the extremely grindy situation of the agents like some people have five or six agents some people are still grinding every day and haven't even got their second one so <laughs> i mean you know we're, we're living through that literally just to, just to get to the story content yeah, this is the make or break moment i think how this content is received to me dictates whether this is a game a year from now or not at this point um, <laughs> because it's the sole reason people put up with all right we'll go with you for this ride but you better pay it off you better pay it off uh zach go ahead I'm going to give a dub bomb to Total War Arena. Uh, I played it a good bit last week and the week before that. I um, haven't so much this week because I my Black Desert Online addiction started again. <laughs> uh, so I've been playing that a lot. Um, but it's a really, really good sort of uh, real-time strategy game. And as long as you have friends to play with, uh, you're going to have a good time. But if you're just stuck with just grouping in a bunch of randoms, the game is so team oriented um, I would say a little bit more than some MOBAs even that you just can't really win um, a good chunk of games if you're playing solo it's just, it's very difficult but um, playing with friends completely changes that and that's what I've been doing so really good game nice I'm going to give a dub bomb to Warframe's 5th anniversary and crossing the 38 million accounts threshold that's a pretty damn impressive number even though it's just accounts um and freebies. Yay, freebies. So Zephyr Prime is obviously going to be coming to the, the game uh, PC and Xbox on March 20th. Uh, PlayStation releases are between the 20th and 22nd, depending on what part of the world you're in. But on the freebie side, from now until March 28th, you can log into the game, get an Excalibur deck skin, uh, and includes a unique Warframe skin for free, as well as all kinds of other loot by completing different alerts. So... Celebrations abound in the Warframes. Unfortunately, my looter shooter uh, addiction is uh, that went from Destiny 2 to Warframe is now back in the Division. So, <laughs> Division my... 2, though. I know. I know. Can't wait. Uh, from the viewers, Kurukan says, A bomb to DE in Warframe. Why you got to do that? Wait. I just. I I think this is backwards. I think I think they got their A-bombs and their D-bomb backwards oh, okay. when I read well, it. Let, let's read it and we'll see. <laughs> I never stick too long with a game, but it makes an excellent pit stop between my main games. Always amazes me that an obscure unknown studio went on to become that big and maintain such a great game. Yeah, you meant duh bomb Like, that game is duh bomb Duh. D-A. Good. On the flip side... <laughs> Dub bomb to the MMORPG subreddit. Never before has there been a more obnoxious... Yeah, you meant A-bomb, as in the weapon of mass destruction for this. So, you're right, Q. They're switched. Whew. 
and I, I look at Warframe the same way. It's like my go-between games. Uh, A-bomb to MMORPG subreddit. Never before has there been a more obnoxious, angry, and salty circle jerk on the internet. <laughs> if you want to discuss MMORPGs, I suggest taking everything they say with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Go ahead, Q. Uh, Issa Mione. Cabal 2 was literally dead since the beginning. One, yeah, CryEngine 3 made a great graphic make great graphics for the MMO project, but as any other Korean MMO game wasn't optimized enough for any settings level graphics. Seriously, Crisis 3 worked with three times higher FPS at medium settings than Cabal 2 at lowest. Uh, Cabal 2 ruined most of what we loved in the original Cabal Chains, yeah. Battle Aura, Battle Mode, Awakening, Voider, Force Classes, and of course, free will to learn skills from books. Yeah, there's something uh, reminding BM and Cabal 2, but they don't stand close to Battle Mode's badass in Cabal. The only memorable thing in Cabal 2 are the fatalities. Kind of fun, at least. Yeah, and um, that's what we kind of said last week, was Cabal 2 damned itself by being too different from the original. Go ahead, Zach. Mm -hmm. Joshua Hines said, Tron had the potential to be a real rival for Blizzard. Somewhere along the road, they ended up getting greedy and weren't willing to really pump out updated code, content, optimization, and mechanics, and pretty much shot their own foot. Can't disagree. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. I mean, they're Tryon and Q and I have had this conversation privately because we're both generally <laughs> or ha were for years Tryon fans that have been trying hard to stay Tryon fans <laughs> anymore. But I, the only part of that I kind of, all of their wounds to me have really been self inflicted. So I kind of agree yeah. with that. I don't know if I ever agree that they had the potential to be a real rival for Blizzard. Uh, in, in the time that Rift came out, at that time, I don't think anybody was ever in competition <laughs> oh, to be a real no. rival for Blizzard at that time. In the long term game, Joshua, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right in the but long term they game. Did, they did do an amazing job with the Rift launch, which is why everybody had so much hope for that little company. Yeah. Yep. Because they came out of nowhere and they went, look, a game that there's not even really any problems with. Have it. Yeah. I was completely fine with them till Arc Age. <laughs> uh, I was fine with them. I Yeah, you're right, because that's when my boycott started. Was, yeah, uh, stopped it was just playing so Rift bad. and stopped spending money in Rift because of uh, how bad things got with Arc Age for like a what a year and a half. I didn't play anything Try on Worlds. Yeah. Uh, Blaine Fiasco says, A-bomb to the Hyper Universe community. I got into the game recently, but think I'm going to drop it because it seems pretty dead, and I don't need to love another dead game. I just learned a bunch of players left over censorship of some of the female characters a few months ago. And by that, I mean just a little bit of cloth over some cleavage. To think I was beginning to think that gamers weren't so petty and immature as to whine about anime titties. And please... <laughs> I had to say it that way because Blaine used the D's in, in the word, not the double T in the middle. So I had, today's, I had to say it like that. I Sorry. It wasn't me. Blaine wrote it that way. Uh, and please, none of that censorship is bad nonsense or inappropriate. Things in media get censored all the time. Curse words, ding-dongs, blood and guts. I think these people just get it twisted with the anti-free speech type of censorship. And it's been happening in games since the freaking Atari. Uh, to me, I, I don't, I don't care. You want to show boobs? Great. You don't want to show boobs? <laughs> I don't care. That's not why I'm playing anyway. Uh, go ahead, Q. Uh, Tevik Eleven. I can't believe I'm actually saying this, but the bomb to try on. What? Yes, try on. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> for Rift Prime. Stripping out all the bullshit that ruined the game and giving it an old school feel has made it great fun. Uh, it's really packed and everyone seems to be enjoying it. It's probably saved the live game from going into maintenance. Wait, was the live game that... <laughs> like, the last time I was in there, I just got really annoyed because I was in one of those zones where you just run around forever trying to find that one little place to enter a space and and just, just out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I Prime appears to be doing really well. And Elusive X Treasure, who is a frequent commenter on the site, um, is often pictured or talked about here. Not pictured. We don't we don't like put her picture. Up. <laughs> is, is often quoted uh, for their for her feedback on the show uh, because they posted on the site. Yes, I'm biased. If you post your comment on the site, 
I give preference to the people that post there to get their comments into the show because you took the time to visit the site. I love you too, YouTube, but a little love. Just not as much. A little extra love <laughs> to the people that take the time to visit the site. It's appreciated. Uh, Elusive wrote this whole long post that I can't read here about like all the things that that is, you know, because we kind of just glossed over that it was sub based and, and stuff because we it wasn't a topic we were covering. If you're, it's actually also an elusive. I knew this being the Rift fan, but I'm going to say it here for people so that your message gets out. It's not just that there's a sub based server, it's treated like a progression server, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to start yep. over. The expansion stuff isn't there yet. Um, it may be. They haven't talked about timing for release and that stuff. Uh, so if you're looking for that classic Rift experience, this is it, bad boys. Uh, go ahead, Zach. Uh, Slash Coon says, The Bomb 2 Revelations new producer doing great for the game. We shall see how it works in the long run. Neo Phantom. Shut the hell up, dog. Neo Phantom, <laughs> since you mentioned it, I'm going to give an A-bomb to the secret world. I used to play a lot, doing endgame content with friends, hanging out, doing side quests, etc. I also used to buy all the story DLCs and a few costumes here and there. Since the game went on maintenance mode, most people I played with stopped playing, including myself, and were not interested in the new system even after we tried it for about two weeks. I don't know how profitable the new game is for them, but they officially lost at least four consistent, active, and paying players. Rip TSW, you will be missed neo add me to the list five i have every issue i have a bunch of costumes and stuff i paid cash for all of it i didn't get any of it as freebies for working at an mmo site uh, but i just i couldn't do it either i couldn't do it either go ahead q uh sideshow geek de bomb to charmin mega rolls because of bless is going six months without wiping they'll have one hell of a mess on their hands <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh... Go ahead, Zach. Uh, Lehman Russ says, I agree on the high-res thing. Like, what the fuck? All the new skins in Achilles patch and chest, LOL. Yeah, so uh, Troy <laughs> Troy was mad last week, be, uh, last show, because of uh, the skins for Smite being in chests rather than just being able to buy them. Oh. Uh, yeah. Breckner Catalin, A-bomb to Grinding Gear Games for saving my favorite CCG Soulforge just to abandon it instantly. The game servers are still up, but the game is dead. And Breckner, to be fair, I remember covering that uh, GGG took Soulforge over and was, like, rescuing it. I honestly had to look it up when I read your A-bomb to see if it was still a thing. That's how little I've heard of it. Uh, coming across my desk as far as news goes too so you're you got to be dead on uh question of the week last time was all right so what are your thoughts on a reworked defiance should Tryon have went with rift instead or how about a new ip even zach what are your thoughts real quick since you weren't on that show about the whole defiance 2050 thing I don't think it's going to be enough to even warrant calling it a revamp. I mean, unless they completely redo all the texture work and completely graphically overhaul that game, it has really no chance, in my opinion. The funny thing, Q, like, when they did that little stream, like, they tried to show some of the texture improvements, and they showed a picture of, like, broken asphalt road uh, on the current version and broken asphalt, and everybody was like, well, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's a little better. <laughs> I mean... I mean, yeah, I mean, it looks a little more smoothed out. I mean, there's lots of changes, right? The ego rating's going away. You're getting levels. There's a bunch of system changes. Itemization is a word they said 700 times in their stream. Um, so there is a lot of changes going on. But... Wait, was that was that the stream that I just gave up on because they kept swapping people out yeah. instead of sticking to a single yeah. topic so I could figure yeah. out what the hell was the going one on? Where, the one where they still <laughs> never answered, like, at the time, the number one question, what the hell is this? Is it a new yeah, game? Is it a continuous? is it what we it was, we, we, did we did get our interview replies we did get our interview replies so you could check that out on mmobomb.com if you have questions we got a lot of those questions answered but yeah it was like a meet the team stream uh advertised as a sneak peek at defiance 2050 uh so it's yeah, hard. it was. Uh, Karukan says, Playing Defiance would be interesting, and I would definitely give it a shot when it launches. I do, however, feel as if Tryon have been searching the log files, emptying the records, and scouring the minutes of all creative meetings to find a new idea. Found some intern's notes on everything wrong with Defiance and thought, Hey, maybe we can just dig up this old thing and make it good. Surely they'll go for that. 
Maybe I'm cynical and this rework comes from a place of love, but it takes more than love to rework a game. And unless it has a battle royale mode, I don't think people are going to stick to it for long. No hate to old Defiance players. It sucks that your game's been neglected, and I hope you find something you like along with some longevity in this rework. I think that Korukan, that is an excellent, excellent comment. On, on the maintenance mode thing, as far as the original Defiance, that is one of the questions we did get answered. They do plan to continue to run the original Defiance uh, to an undetermined period of time. Um, we couldn't quite nail them down on if it was going to receive updates. The, the answers kind of led us to believe that events would still happen, but... We kind of, Q and I in the background, look at this more of like a Secret World Legends situation. Uh, where the old version will be up for X period of time, but it's probably going to be maintenance mode. Uh, go ahead, Q, take the next one. Uh, Lucifer's Treasure, speaking of, <laughs> I think this is testing the waters, but I don't see them remaking Rift. Rift is older, yes, but the class system alone is a lot more complex. I mean, it's 4,000 plus possible combinations. So as much as I'd love to see that, I don't think it's happening. I would love an MMO based in As Atlas Reactor's world. I think that would be badass. In a nutshell, I'll definitely be checking it out. It's been divisive in its reception on the forums, as has Prime, so I guess we'll wait and see. I would love the Rift remake and like right. Unreal 4 or an right. engine that's not the damn oh, hero pretty, engine. Pretty, pretty Rift. <laughs> uh, and just so that I get the quote right here, this is from our interview. Original Defiance will continue running up to and after Defiance 2050 launches. The game will receive event updates and players can continue to log in and play. Additionally, we're working on a Valor Rule Rewards system for people who jump in and play the original Defiance before 2050 launches which we'll have more info on soon. The, t the two things about that, one, if you read between the lines, the original Defiance ain't getting any more updates uh, once 2050 launches. You'll still get your events, but you aren't getting new content. The other thing that I hate about this, like, I like the idea of a system to keep you from one game to the next game. Division 2 is doing it, right? We just talked about that earlier. They're implementing a system where uh, if you're playing the original Division now, in the next update, they're going to have additional, like, challenges and things that you can do that will give you specific rewards in Division 2 when you start. I like that idea. I like that idea. I don't like the idea that they're doing here. Like, they're doing kind of the same thing. But it's a different situation. When I go from Division 1 to Division 2, Q, I'm playing an entirely different story. Uh, entirely different content. I hate the idea of a Valor reward system to try and entice me to go in and play your old game right now when you've already answered previously that... When I asked about the storyline in 2050, the Defiance story will be unaltered for the most part, but with a new title comes new support for the game, allowing us to create a lot of new story content that we'll be releasing over time. It would have been like in Secret World saying, hey, go play the Secret World right now and start from scratch, and based on these things you do, we'll give you Valor that you could buy cosmetic stuff in Secret World Legends where you're going to have to start over what we're trying to entice you to go do right now. So Ugh. see, this is this is where I'm confused because when when I was taking the notes, trying to take the notes on their stream and stuff and everything else, and I think maybe something I uh, I read somewhere, uh, it, actually I think it was the FAQ. It basically said so. Defiance takes place in 2046, and there it's this is supposed to take place in 2050. So it's supposed to start like five years after the original Defiance. So how is the story going to be exactly the same? Well, and, and I, when, I, when I asked him specifically, like, what is this? A remaster? A, a new thing? They, he said reimagining is the word that they feel best describes it. The move to current general con gen generation consoles is a huge step forward, but the innovative changes that are coming in Defiance 2050 are really what make it shine. Much of what makes Defiance successful will remain. The engrossing story and the amazing combat. Eh. See, this, this... This yeah. whole thing makes me a little mad. I don't know mad. if amazing is the word I'd use there, Zach. <laughs> the, the whole thing makes me a little mad because it's a, it's actually very unclear as to what's going on. They've made it sound yeah. like, oh, we're just revamping it and it's going to be the same. It's going to be all the same content, but we're making changes to the systems and stuff like that. So like Secret World Legends. And then, oh, but this takes place four years after the original Defiant started. So technically, it should be a completely different 
you know, part of the storyline, like, yeah, you got the same characters, you'll probably be in the same areas, but it's it's not the same. It's a, conti- a continuation of the story if it starts four years later. Yeah. Like, it makes that's, no sense. That's really at bizarre. All. And, like, the Valor yeah. system, I don't have a problem with being rewarded in, and the Secret World Legends did it to a certain extent, you know, if, if you got that, that coat through a certain achievement in the original game, you were able to bring that coat over. Yeah, it wasn't all items, <laughs> but I, I'm fine with that. If you want to look at my old Defiance account and take over titles and achievements and, and things like that, fine. And the Valor system is going to give you credit for any money that you spent in the original Defiance and give you additional Valor points in defiance 2052 uh, fine i'm fine with all of that i just i hate the idea of hey we would really like if you went and played defiance right now knowing that in x number of months because this comes out in the summer so it's just a few months away we're gonna ask you to restart all of that story that you did and start leveling under an entirely new leveling system because we're not using the ego rating anymore you're gonna get traditional levels uh man that's it's kind of dick. <laughs> it's kind of dick. It's good for the people that have been playing, right? They, they've yeah. already done all the things they need to do. But I don't like that. I think the thing that I don't like is them reaching out, trying to entice people to play the original Defiance as a brand new player right now. That's kind of dick, knowing in a couple of months you're going to make them play that same content over again. Uh, go ahead, Zach. Uh, Formako Kilowar says maybe Defiance will try to do what Destiny couldn't, but I'm not sure when Defiance launched back then. As a free to play, they were there were many people playing. I just prefer more the fantasy MMORPGs than sci-fi. And you know what? I think that is certainly a valid thing. Seeing how not well received Destiny Two has been, that's why I'm playing The Division right now. I, I'm Jones in for a looter shooter. Um, Although I have to believe that they've been working on this a little longer than Defiance's issues or uh, Destiny's issues. But that is definite. And with Anthem being delayed and now writers leaving and stuff, there is a market that maybe that is the reason for for this whole thing. Who knows? I mean, and so we see that they have to show a lot more. It's that I can't imagine they have a, a even a medium sized team. It's probably like maybe. I, I can't. It's, it's probably a very, very small amount of people working on it. So you can't expect a lot from it other than, you know, this like an update size of like there, content. See, I can't do that to them. Some of the things that I've seen that they are doing are big, massive overhauls. Um, like and... the ego rating, like the itemization. That is a huge overhaul that they are doing to some of those in-game but systems. How well is it, it, may be a, it may be a small deaths. team, and we don't know if it's if, if it's going to be well-received and well-executed, but I have to give them credit that on the systems I've seen so far, and we're going to see more over the coming weeks. There's a stream tomorrow. Um, I These are some huge overhauls, but... You got to be a fan of Defiance already to really want to go in. I think since it isn't new. I think too, if if you had watched the last stream they did, that it was basically a parade of devs yeah. coming through the entire mm-hmm. time, and they pretty much said then that oh you'll meet more of our team later. So I don't know like what the size of the team is but i i get the impression they're actually investing a lot of effort into this yeah i don't from, i like, don't want to minimize the amount of work they're doing they are doing some very big overhauls and tweaks and changes to things in this game that to me it may have been better to start from scratch in certain regards when i think about it but that's just not the option they chose to your point zach though it's going to depend on how well it's executed as to whether yeah, they're believe, perceived when I to be it. big changes or not. Uh, yeah. Bits Turn Byte says, we'll never touch a game that's associated with Tryon. Tryon is the Larry Nasser of the video game industry. Oof. That's a bit Ow. rough. <laughs> Go ahead, Q. Uh, Sean Clausen, if they want to reboot Defiance properly, aside from just remaking, uh, remarketing campaign and slight graphical upgrade, which we've already determined it's more than that. But yep. <laughs> it would be nice if they redid the skill or class system as the classes don't matter. They, they also are. Need to, 
They also mm-hmm. need to add at least six other races that inhabit the world to allow for more than just three that you can play with one that you have to pay for DLC to get. I would also add all the DLC to the pay- base game. All right, we can't comment on the races because we don't know about any plans for that yet, but we can tell you, yeah, the class and skill system is being totally revamped as well to make classes matter. Uh, and you'll actually have to pick specific classes too. So, uh, James as far as the question of the week, I actually really like the different types of weaponry in Defiance, and I'm excited to see what becomes of it. In my humble opinion, I just think they're taking a page out of Funcom's book and making some alterations to an existing game. It's probably them trying to make some kind of hype without making anything new or providing resources and money up the yin-yang to do it. And I think you're dead on there. But it's going to smack and scream that that's exactly what they did if they don't do it well. And that'll be a PR disaster. Go ahead, Q. Uh, Elvin One, Defiance is the perfect game to remaster, in my opinion. It's a genre that currently yep. that is currently pop- popular, but still not oversaturated with the failure of Destiny 2 and the expectations of Anthem. And at the same time, most people who have played it but quit remember a ton of missed potential and people that have not played it probably have not heard anything either good or bad about it an existing player base in an already developed world that is quite interesting on top of that and you actually have both a potential hit and a pretty safe bet that the game is going to be at least making an investment put into put into back here's the thing that i worry about you it sounds exactly like secret world to secret world legends but the story in the secret world was phenomenal mm. enough to the point that people were willing to do it all again because your Defiance character does not come to Defiance 2050. You got to start over there, too. That people like you were willing to say, I want more of that story. I just don't feel like the story in Defiance was anywhere near that level of interest for somebody that's put hundreds of hours into the original to want to do it again. Well, the point of The Secret World was the story. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, everything else. I mean, yeah, there was the big deal about the the skill wheel and all of that stuff, making it completely different. But the point of the game was the story and the investigation missions and that kind of stuff. It was, I mean, so yeah, th- that was where they invested all their time. Go ahead, Zach. Tidania says, after the delay of Anthem and the failures of Destiny, there might be a nice spot for Defiance if they can do a better job of getting the word out. And we've already kind of alluded to that. I think there's an opportunity here. I don't know. Here. It's so old. <laughs> I think there's an opportunity here. Will they capitalize on it? Uh, and Anthem, oh man, that just keeps getting scarier by the day, doesn't it? They've now had a bunch of writers, key writers leave. and uh, Oh, and it was delayed, but not technically a delay. <laughs> uh, Blue Arian says, Tryon is making the right decision. Tryon, Defiance already has a fan base they can milk for money. And they don't have to pay writers for something new because they already have everything in the original. Got the world and lore all ready for them. If they made a new IP, who will say... I can't want to play the can't wait to play the new Tryon game to see how they'll rip us off this time. The Rift fan base they already gave Tryon the money for basic gameplay features like equipment slots and are currently paying them for the privilege to start over in a game they already got everything for. That's that's not a jaded <laughs> viewpoint or anything. I think uh, Blue uh, is, is Zach. Is that you? Is that your YouTube name? <laughs> Go ahead, Q. Uh, Jack Bandit. I think this remake, re-release, whole new game of the, the and that was pretty much all one word <laughs> <laughs> of defiance is definitely risky business. However, someone like for someone like me, it's a godsend. I really want to enjoy the original game and did get into it for a while as it hit that semi-lacking niche of sci-fi MMO genre. Hopefully, things will go similar to Secret World Legends, which is now my favorite game at the moment, but also learn from their Secret World Legends mistakes in the new. If the new Defiance fixes enough of the problems that the old Defiance had and also introduces enough new mechanics and content at launch, then Tryon surely will have done their job. Otherwise, I can see it falling by the wayside shortly after launch. Well, I can already X part of that off the list. At launch, you aren't getting new content. (laughs) Go ahead, Zach. (laughs) Zodson Sinister Swarm says, Remake Defiance 2050 equals fail times 2050. 
I have played the game on PC. It was fun. It sounds like they're just porting it over to Xbox One. By the way, is the show still running? Oh, are we still here? No. No, not no, no, us. Why it's the show. <laughs> no, that Come ended on. after. <laughs> <laughs> I realized that after I said that. Wait, wait. Defiance. I no, Defiance no. Show. Zotson Defiance watched the free to play no. cast and commented on it, and then asked if we were still running. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they missed it. I don't know. <laughs> did I? Did I ever tell you guys my theory about Defiance and Defiance the show? No. Like why Defiance the game is a thing. Well, they announced Defiance pretty much right after Rift launched. Um, like it, they, they, I know for a fact because I got. I think six months before Tryon even told people that Rift was a thing, I got a beta key for it. And oh god, what was that other game of theirs uh, that, that totally disappeared? The little war the game end of something. Oh, that one. Okay, so I got beta keys for both of those from a buddy of mine who worked at GameStop. So I knew about both those games well before they were ever announced. But right after. Rift came out, they started going, oh, and we're doing this really cool thing with the sci-fi channel, it, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And they, you know, they started touting it and everything. And I started sitting back and thinking about it. And I'm sitting there going, I wonder if this company that just kind of came out of nowhere and has this game that's, you know, awesome and, and ready to go pretty much at the drop of a hat, didn't get the money to do all of it from the sci-fi channel. And that was the deal. <laughs> Like uh, you see, I'm kind of looking they, right now here. They paid for every like they paid for doing this game by making a deal with Sci-Fi, and then said, "Okay, and we'll do a game to go with your show." Yeah, so Rift was in development from 2006, released in 2011, and then Defiance was in development from 2008 and released in 2013. So Rift was in the works for about two years before Defiance. To, uh, production or development started. Right, but I mean, it's kind of yeah. like I feel like they might have gotten money to do Rift from Sci-Fi it, <laughs> as part of a deal if they did Defiance. That's uh, how I always felt about see, Defiance. That's the, that's the thing, though, is like I I completely forgot the show exists because it was only like what one season. Uh, two, I think, I two, think it was it two, two or three? I, I, two. I, I yeah. said I said two last week, and I think somebody on the show told me that no, there was a third. Did they make a third? I, I I don't know. I only remember one season. I watched like I two episodes of it. Yeah, I, it that's I only remember ever watching. Yeah, apparently, according to the wiki, there were three seasons. Uh, I only watched the first two. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I even watched. I watched a couple of episodes and was kind of like, eh. Yeah, speaking of the, the whole sci-fi thing, though, before we sign off today, and I know we're going long, but who, who cares? If you like the <laughs> show, watch it. We're still on. Um <laughs> <laughs> I jokingly asked in the interview, and if you if you're interested in this, check out the interview uh, on on mmobomb.com. Uh, I do get a lot of good questions answered. Uh, some of them are just PR answers occasionally, but there are some good things there. And I did ask about Rift. They said Rift Prime is coming. Yeah, I know. That's not I jokingly asked any TV show tie-ins we can expect this time around, and they said nope. Okay, haha, we had some fun. Then I asked. Is the Sci-Fi Channel still uh, invested in the Defiance IP in any way? Uh, do they obviously they're not doing a show, but are they still a financial stakeholder in any intellectual property profits? You know that kind of thing. Are they? Do they care about this That's in right. any way, shape, or form? Um, and they said initially they said, "Hey, we're not going to get into uh, the PR person that I talked to." Initially said, "Well, I don't think they're going to be able to speak uh, in great detail about any of that stuff." And I said, "I'm not really asking for great detail." I said, "At the end of the day, I'm really just kind of asking when I boot up Defiance 2050, am I going to see a sci-fi logo along with the Try on Try on Worlds logo?" Right? Um, they, they still wouldn't answer. Uh, they said we don't talk about any public contracts, or we don't talk publicly about contracts. And I said, maybe okay. there's a little short movie in the works. Well, I said, okay, I'll reach out to Sci-Fi about it, and and I also told them, I said, well, you kind of have to understand that when you tell me you won't speak publicly about contracts, it implies that there's, there's a contract, a contract. <laughs> yeah. which was all I was really asking was, 
do they, you know, do they still want to see this succeed? Because they get a couple of bucks even for not doing anything. So I had to put in the interview. At this point, we did ask if the Sci-Fi Channel had any ties to the new division of Defiance, even if it was just a financial interest in the game slash IP's continued success. Tryon declined to comment, citing that they don't comment publicly about contracts. We've reached out to Sci-Fi. Uh, to date, I haven't received anything, to see if we can expect to see Sci-Fi's logo upon boot up of Defiance 2050, and we'll update you with any pli reply we receive. I just thought it was really a bizarre... Like, I've had developers say, we can't answer that, we don't talk publicly, and I kind of get, all right, I know why they're not talking about this. But this one I didn't get. It was like... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it yeah, depends I mean, where the show left off. They could do like a movie, like just a one-off just to promote it. And I don't know. It's weird. Question of the week for this week. Is Dota 2's new assistant being behind a subscription pay to win? Why or why not? Put your comments in the, the comment spot below. Don't forget your weekly bombs. Da bomb for something good. Da bomb for something good. A bomb as in the weapon for something bad, or just your questions for the panel. Now, remember, no show next week, so we'll see you in two weeks. Until then, Zach, where can everybody find you? Eric can find me on Twitter at Zach Sharps. Beware, I might ramble randomly on Twitter because I've been sleep-deprived the past week because of, like, finals and whatnot. So, Oh, yeah. that's cool. Final thing. quarter stuff. Final quarter stuff. Cute! Uh, also on Twitter at Quitlin, I probably won't random f ramble from sleep deprivation because I've been getting sleep. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Small miracles. My name's Mike Fern. You can follow me personally on Twitter at MagicMan1. But more importantly, while you're there, hit up at MMOBomb with a follow so that you can get all the interviews from Defiance 2050 uh, and from everybody else. First looks, videos, articles, news, previews, and first and uh, free to play casts right in your Twitter feed. Until next week, stay safe. See you on the servers. Two weeks.